Um, I made these kind of a mind map. I'll share with you the whole one at the very end because I feel like this section in particular, there was just a lot of stuff to keep track of. And for me, it was helpful to make a map of each thing and how it kind of fits into the overall big picture. So I'm gonna break down the gas in this way. Um, the two processes that we've learned about so far about how an atom interacts with light are it can absorb the light or it can emit light, right? And so uh, their emission processes, there's a lot of those. And uh, uh, these are all separated based on their temperature. So ultra hot gases versus hot gases versus cold gases versus very cold gases all act a little bit differently. So they emit light from you know, the highest energies, X-ray, for the hottest regions of space, down through the visible region for just hot gas, down through uh, radio uh, for the cool gases and the infrared as well. And then the other thing that gas can do is absorb light. So uh, this only really pops up for lower density clouds, because remember the hot density, the hot gases are uh, sources of emission. So it's only when you have starlight filtering through cool gas clouds that we get absorption. And that is pretty familiar to you. Um, so I think that's where we'll turn first. So these cool interstellar gas clouds, basically what happens is a spectrum from a star passes through the uh, dust cloud or interstellar gas cloud. These are, remember, mostly gas. So your textbook labels this as a dust cloud, but it's mostly gas. And because the star is um, at a higher pressure, it has broader absorption lines. And so when we look at the spectrum after it's passed through the gas clouds, there are a few extra lines owing to the absorption in the cloud itself, but those are narrow lines. So you can pick them out separately from the broader lines of the star. Plus, we, we already know what stellar spectra look like pretty well. And so you can kind of, you know, subtract out the lines that were already there because of the star. And then based on that, you can learn about the composition of the gas cloud. So this is how we know what the um, interstellar clouds are made of. So just to test this idea a little bit, which one of these would show starlight passing through a cool gas cloud? All right, I'm seeing most votes for B. Um, that's exactly right. So the, the stars spectrum would be, you know, something like A maybe a spectrum with broader spectral lines. And then those narrow spectral lines are added by the gas cloud. So D by itself would maybe be just the gas cloud. Uh, a by itself could be just the star. And then C, that looks like just a red shifted version of A. So moving on to the emission processes. So that was the one absorption process. Now we have our three emission processes. Um, the most familiar one of these to you is probably the H2 regions of hot hydrogen. And this is just um, when a hot young star uh, is emitting light, um, it has some portion of its spectrum in the ultraviolet range. And that ultraviolet light can um, excite the hydrogen gas. And so then it re-emits red light as it relaxes. So therefore the light that we see from those regions is mostly red. And um, just to remind you, the hydrogen emission spectrum in the visible range has four lines, and this H alpha line is the red one that we're seeing here. So this is the lowest energy line um, of that spectrum. The other hydrogen lines, there's a whole other series of hydrogen emission lines, but they're all in the ultraviolet, so we don't see them uh, in images like this. And also they decay all the way to the ground state. So these hydrogen two regions, um, they are not neutral hydrogen. They have to be ionized. So this can only exist around a hot star. Okay, so just to tie this to what we learned about black body curves, suppose that the ultraviolet wavelength that can excite and ionize that hydrogen could only be 91.2 nanometers or shorter then which of these stars do you think would be the most successful at creating a red emission nebula like the one we just saw? I am now seeing overwhelming votes for A, and that's exactly right. So if we need to have 91.2 nanometer or below light in order to ionize that hydrogen so it can glow in the red, 
then A is the only curve that has uh, a considerable amount of radiation uh, at wavelengths shorter than 91.2 nanometers. So, you know, curve B has a little bit, so maybe you could get a bit of an emission nebula from curve B, but curve A definitely has more uh, light in the UV. And notice that it doesn't um, have to peak in exactly the UV in order for, uh, for it to create an emission nebula. It just needs to have enough light at that uh, wavelength or at higher energies. Okay, so um, in other words, this means that it takes a very hot star in order to create an emission nebula. All right, so we've seen now um, cool gas that creates absorption spectra, hot gas excited by stars that emit in the UV creating those H2 regions of red um, glow. And now let's look at even hotter gas. So there's some gas that is so hot um, that it actually glows in the X-ray. So this is an image of a system that was shocked by a supernova explosion. And so you can kind of see the kind of filaments here at the edges of the center of this picture. There's kind of like things that look like the edges of bubbles. And that's areas where the um, explosion pushed material through space and kind of smashed it up together. So there's a bit of higher density regions in those areas of the filaments. And um, because that process happened really fast, it created a shock wave in the gas and excited it to extremely high temperatures. Um, and so that now glows in the X-ray. And so this image is in the visible range, but this is the image of the same area in the X-ray. So it's a, a million Kelvin in the gas in this region, uh, which is extremely hot compared to the rest of space. And so it glows at very high energies. So this is basically a, um, you know, one of the, the hottest types of gases that we measure. Um, and they're all, they must be produced by this type of you know, violent outburst. All right, so the emission is the, at the highest energy for the very highest temperatures. All right, so moving to the very cold end of things, um, molecular clouds are some of the largest and coldest objects that are uh, in space. And these are called molecular clouds because they're not made of single atoms of gas, like the H2 regions are made of just hydrogen. The X-ray glowing region is made of mostly hydrogen. Um, but the molecular clouds are made of molecules like um, H2, so two hydrogens bound together, water, uh, carbon monoxide, um, ammonia, and other heavier molecules, even things like the precursors that make amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. So um, it's surprising maybe that these objects can condense because um, they could be destroyed by ultraviolet radiation. Uh, but it turns out that these molecular clouds also contain enough dust that the dust helps to, you know, absorb that, that UV kind of in the same way that our atmosphere does in order to protect the molecules inside the clouds. So these places um, are very cold. Uh, this is the only reason that the molecules are able to condense. If it was warmer there, then they would be dissociated into their individual atoms. But because it's so cold, they're able to condense into molecules. So these are about 10 degrees Kelvin, which is really close to absolute zero. Um, and these molecular clouds, the coldest regions of space are the birthplace areas of new stars. Um, this one in particular is a famous cloud called Bernard 68. And when um, astronomers, I think it was William Herschel, uh, who was the person who started to map out the structure of the Milky Way galaxy, when he saw this image, well, not this image, but a similar image of this cloud, he saw a hole in space. He thought that it was just like a hole where the stars were gone. Uh, but now we know that it's an area where um, the light is being blocked by this dense, dark, cold cloud. So this is the primary feature of a molecular cloud is to block sunlight or starlight. Um, okay, but these also glow. So they block light, which is the main effect that we're seeing here, but they also glow in the radio and the infrared um, according to their temperature. So even though they're very cold, they still have black body emission and it's just in the infrared and the uh, radio wave length range because of the 
that's just the color that the dust glows. Okay. So yeah, the exact um, wavelengths of radio and infrared also depend on the molecules because sometimes there are, like we talked about atomic transitions in a single atom, but molecules can do other things other than just absorb and move their electrons around. They can actually rotate and vibrate and those interactions also have characteristic wavelengths in the radio and IR. So even though it's very cold, they sometimes uh, rotate and vibrate and in doing so emit photons in the radio and IR. Okay, there's one more radio range that's really, really important. And that is uh, the 21 centimeter line of neutral hydrogen. So neutral hydrogen, it's electrically neutral because it has one proton and one electron. And so this is in contrast to um, ionized hydrogen, which is just the proton by itself. And um, there's basically, there's this property called spin and you can actually literally think of it as the direction that the particles are spinning. And those can either be parallel or they can be anti-parallel. And when there are small collisions, um, the, the lowest energy state is the anti-parallel state. But if um, the atoms bump together with other atoms, then they can gain a little bit of energy so that the spins are made parallel. And then that will persist for long periods of time um, until spontaneously, occasionally, one of them will flip back down. And when it flips back down to anti-parallel, it will emit a radio wave in the 21 centimeter wavelength. And so even though this doesn't happen very often, there's so much neutral hydrogen out in space that we can actually detect a lot of light from this 21 centimeter line. And um, this radio line is really important because it doesn't get scattered by dust. It doesn't get um, blocked by dust in the same way that our visible light did. Remember back to our cloud, Bernard 68 was a dark region in space. Well, we can actually see right through it if we look in the 21 centimeter range. So this is an example of um, some of the information that we can see by looking in the 21 centimeter range. This is on the right, as opposed to just looking at the total light intensity in the visible range. We can see through those dark clouds in order to map out, in this case, some of the gases that are in galaxies that are interacting. And the location of these gases, especially between the galaxies, is completely invisible in this visible image. This image on the left, by the way, is it's inverted. So the dark areas here are actually bright regions. It's just easier to see it if you plot it this way. All right, so that's everything about how gases interact with light. And like I said, this it's a lot to keep track of. So if you prefer the map, I'll have a link for you to the kind of mind map version, organizing this, or you can use this table. And again, the different temperatures are uh, very important to consider what energy of light that we're seeing. So you can use the energy as a proxy to figure out how hot is that region of space, where the X-rays will be the hottest, followed by the um, H alpha regions, followed by the um, interstellar gas cloud absorption, neutral hydrogen, and then our molecular clouds are the coldest thing.